1 Kings 12 is where we'll pick up here in just a moment this evening. But before we get started in 1 Kings, I want to go through the outline of the book as we've been doing each week. We've outlined the book into our we've outlined both books of 1 and 2 Kings together, and we've outlined them in the three major sections. The first 11 chapters of 1 Kings is the reign of Solomon. That's what we finished last week. Beginning at chapter 12 and going through 17 of 2 Kings is the divided kingdom. That's we're going to see that take place in our chapter tonight. And that ends in chapter 17 is 18 through 25 is what we have recorded for us the falls of both Israel and the fall of Judah. And so that's how we have the book outlined. So we'll begin that second section tonight on the divided kingdom. At the same time we're studying 2 Chronicles alongside that, we've divided it into, into two major sections. 1 to 9 is the reign of Solomon, and 10 through 36 is the kings of Judah during the divided kingdom. It's the kings of Judah because Chronicles is focusing on the line of David and on the kings of Judah, and it only talks about the kings of Israel as they come in contact or do something directly impacting the people of Judah. And so we're focused on the kings of Judah, not the kings of Israel. So we'll begin the second section of that, uh, of, of that book as well tonight. As we get started, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. The first 15 verses of 1 Kings 12, which also parallel to the first 15 verses of 2 Chronicles 10, is Rehoboam's poor judgment and his poor decision that leads to the kingdom dividing. Let's pick up at verse 1. Then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. Then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, your father made our yoke hard. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. Then he said to them, Depart for three days, then return to me. So the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me to answer this people? Then they spoke to him, saying, if you, will be his, if you will be a servant to this people today and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? The young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now you make it lighter for us. But you speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke, my father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Let's stop there for just a second. So as Rehoboam becomes king, what's the request that the people come and make of him? What do they come and ask him to do? Lighten the load. Your father's tied, uh, uh, burdened us with heavy loads. And you think about the work that Solomon had done in the building of his palace, in the building of the temple and all the other works that Solomon had done, the people had done a lot of work in the days of Solomon and had been burdened with heavy load. And so they're asking Rehoboam, now that your king lighten that load for us, don't make us do all the work that your father had us do. Rehoboam, and this part was initially very wise, decides to seek counsel on that. He doesn't just make a rash decision, make a decision right there. He says... Give me three days. He asked first, give me some time that I can seek out counsel and think about what I need to do to make this, or to make this decision. He's not rash in making this decision. It's not something he does right off the bat. Give me time. Initially, that was very wise as he asked for this time. But in that time, 
Rehoboam decides to talk to two different groups of people. And who are they? One group was the elders. Here are the people that had counseled his father Solomon. Who's the other group? The young men who grew up with him. So Rehoboam first goes to the elders, goes to the people that counseled his father. That was the wise thing to do. And they, he asked them, you know, what should I do? And what's their reply to him? What, is he, they, what do they say he needs to tell them? Right, that he would serve them. If you will be, verse 7, a servant to this people today and will serve them and grant them their petitions and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. That's good advice that they give him there. Rehoboam decides to seek counsel from the young men. Now, why do you think it is that Rehoboam sought counsel from his companions and from the young men? Possibly didn't like what he heard, right? So if he'd have come to them and they said, you, you tell them I'm going to rule with an iron fist, then he likely would have never sought counsel from the young men. He would have left with the counsel of the elders. But he, came, he, he comes to seek counsel and they say, instead of you making them your servants, you be a servant to them. That didn't sound very good to Rehoboam. And so you, you can imagine as Rehoboam comes to hear that it's likely that as he hears this advice given to him, he thinks, well, why would I, being the king, be a servant to them? And so he goes and he asks his friends. He asks those close to him. He asks those that grew up with him. What do the young men tell him to do? Make the burden heavier. Right. If Rehoboam wanted to rule with an iron fist, that's exactly what they told him to do. You tell them that my little finger is thicker than my father's loins, and that I will add, that my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, and I'm going to add to that. And he disciplined you with whips, but I'm going to discipline you with scorpions. And so here he's telling them, listen, you, they tell Rehoboam, tell the people, listen, whatever you tell them, that I'm not going to make it any easier on you. In fact, I'm going to make it all the harder. Now let's see what Rehoboam does. Look at verse 12. Then Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Return to me on the third day. The king answered the people harshly, for he forsook the advice of the elders which they had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke through Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So here after this takes place, and we'll see this here in, beginning at verse 16 in a moment, it's where the kingdom's going to divide. But they've asked him, you lighten our load. He comes to them and says exactly what the young men told him to say. I'm not going to lighten the load. In fact, I'm going to make the yoke heavier. I'm going to discipline you with scorpions instead of discipline you with whips. And the people aren't pleased with that. The people are not happy about that. But there's something we need to note in verse 15. We're awfully harsh on Rehoboam for what he did, and rightfully so. This was poor judgment on Rehoboam's part. But remember, when the kingdom divides, God already said that's what's going to take place. Remember what happened, what was told to Jeroboam as we saw last week in chapter 11? When Solomon's son would reign, what would happen? Right, so he tells them about the, the kingdom's going to divide. Jeroboam's getting ten of the tribes. The rest is going to go to the family of David, or to the family of Solomon for the sake of David. So this was going to, this was going to happen anyway. And that's why it said that, um, that it was for a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word. This is ultimately Rehoboam's poor judgment that leads to the dividing of the kingdom is the Lord carrying out the plan that he had for the kingdom to divide anyway because he promised Jeroboam that he was going to have ten of the tribes. 
But Rehoboam makes a poor, poor decision here in not listening to the advice of the elders. And that's a good point. He doesn't seek out God's counsel, which is the opposite of what his father had done often and the complete opposite of what his grandfather would have done. Um, you think about as you move throughout, from Rehoboam, what is the kingdom divides and we follow the southern kingdom, it's going to list really two way, things about the kings of Judah. They either walked in the steps of their father David, or they did not walk in the steps of their father David. That is, they either followed the Lord or did not. And Rehoboam, that's a good point, he never sought counsel from God, he only sought the counsel of men. And then even at that, he didn't even listen to the best counsel that was given to him. He listened to the one that seems to please him the most. Because if that had not been what had pleased Rehoboam, then he would have followed the other advice. He would have truthfully sought it out. So the result of that is in 16 to 20, which is also recorded in 16 to 19 of 2 Chronicles 10, is where the kingdom is going to divide. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam set Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. And King Rehoboam made waste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So the kingdom divides here because of Rehoboam's decision. And so the ten tribes that are in the north, they decide we're going to take and we're going to set Jeroboam over us. And in the southern, you have the kingdom of Judah, which says we're going to, we're going to still let, uh, follow Rehoboam. And they follow him there. Beginning at verse 21 now and going through 33 is just some recording of events in the early days of those two kingdoms after the kingdom had divided. We'll have more detail recorded in other places, but here's just some early events. It came about when it, all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned. They sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. So they rebelled against Rehoboam. Now they've set Jeroboam up. They set him over the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Let's stop there for just a second. If you, if you remember, when they're divided up, in the last chapter, that they're divided into the garments divided into twelve. Ten go to Jeroboam, but it's mentioned that one goes, even though there's twelve pieces, one goes to Rehoboam. Well, twelve minus ten leaves two. Benjamin has is, is a pretty small tribe. Judah's pretty much swallowed them up. So both Judah and Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin side with Rehoboam. But Benjamin has come to almost it, it is so small, it's almost swallowed up by Judah. It's just a very small group of people. So that's why it's often referred to as one tribe, and that's why the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah, because that's who the overwhelming majority of the people is. But there are people of Benjamin, who are the people of Benjamin who are following Rehoboam here as well, in verse 21, mentioned in verse 21. But Rehoboam's plan here is, he is going to go to war against Jeroboam and the northern kingdom. His decision is, I'm going to go to war and I'm restoring the kingdom back to, to myself. That's why he wants to go to war. He wants to go to war and win the people back. But, verse 22, the word of God came to Shemai, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You must not go up after against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house. For this thing has come from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. We're going to give some credit here to Rehoboam for all the mistakes Rehoboam made. When the prophet comes to him and says, God said, do not go to war. This thing has come from me. What does Rehoboam do? He listens. He does not go to war. Rehoboam, you know, when you, when you follow the kings of Judah. Israel is easy to remember. If you go to the kingdoms of Israel and you're trying to remember who's good and bad, it's just remember king of Israel, bad, 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 and all the way through. In Judah you have good kings and bad kings. 
Sometimes you have some good bad kings. They start out good and they end bad. Sometimes you have some bad kings that turn good. One of those cases is Manasseh, who we often remember is the most wicked of Judah, but does repent later in his life. But when they're punished, it's still for his sins, and we'll see that when we get to those stories later on. Rehoboam is one of those that makes some bad decisions. And then he turns and he listens to the counsel of God and makes a couple of good decisions and turns right back around and makes some bad decisions again. He's willing to listen in this case when it comes to him. But it doesn't last very long as we're going to turn around and he's going to be found doing wicked again. He, doesn't listen, he only listens to the counsel of God in this case here where it's brought before him. He's willing to listen for a little bit. But then as time goes on, he's going to turn away again. Let's look at verse 25, because 20, beginning of verse 25 is really going to help us in setting up the story of chapter 13. Then Jeroboam built Shechem, the hill country of Ephraim, and lived there, and he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of the people will return for their Lord. Even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And the king consulted and made two golden calves, and he said, them, uh, said to them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you out from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses and high places and made priests from among all the people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month of the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel, on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, and he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. You think about what Jeroboam does here in, 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 in putting these two calves in. I should have put a map up to show you the reasons he stations them at Dan and Bethel or why. What would be the reasons for placing them in those two cities? People could go to either one. If you look on a map for Israel, Dan is the northernmost point, the city of Dan, and Bethel would be the southernmost point. So you put one in the far north and one in the far south. So if you live in the southern area, you just make a quick trip to Bethel. If you live in the, in the northern area, you make a quick trip to Dan. If you live in the middle, you choose wherever you want to go. But it made it easy for people to worship. But in instituting this, there are several things that we could spend the rest of our time on, if time would permit, to, to talk about that Jeroboam did, did wrong with this. But Jeroboam says to them that this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. But let's notice a couple of things that Jeroboam did wrong in his changing here. Number one, Jeroboam changed who is being worshipped, or the article of worship. He's no longer serving God, he's serving the golden calves, he's serving idols. So he's changed the, 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 the object of worship from God to to idols. He has changed the time of worship. He has changed from when the feasts are set for the Passover and all that, that they're to travel back, and he institutes a feast which it says in verse 33, he devised in his own heart. And so he's changed the time of worship. He changed the place of worship. They were to go back to Jerusalem to worship there at the temple. Instead, he's now set it down in Bethel. He's changed the object, he's changed the place, he's changed the time, he's changed the people. Where are the priests to come from? Levi. He's choosing priests from wherever he so desires and appointing whoever he would so desire. So he's changed the people who were to be involved in the worship. He's changed the object of worship, the time, the place, and the people. That's what Jeroboam does here in his instituting of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. He's changing, in reality, what he's done is he's changed everything about worship, except they're offering a sacrifice. That's about the extent of what, they, like what they did before. Yes. He made a complete turn for the worse. He changed everything about their, about their worship. Which well, so that brings us into chapter 13. Because chapter 13 is a familiar story to us, and this is the young prophet that comes to Jeroboam. So 
The first ten verses are where this young prophet and Jeroboam have this conversation. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. He cried against the altar by the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a man shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Now, you might want to take a second. If you highlight in your Bible, you might want to highlight that passage. That's important. Because in 2 Kings 23, 15, where we'll be in a few weeks, it says that furthermore the altar uh, Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made even the altar on the high place he broke down. Then he demolished his stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah. And you know who does that? A king in the southern kingdom by the name of Josiah. And so this verse is important because we learn in this verse about, about prophecy, that God has is, God is pointed and said, this is going to take place. It's a long time until Josiah is going to do that. But it was said here in chapter two, in verse 2 of chapter 13, not only what would happen, but who would be the one to carry it out. That tells us something about prophecy here, and about God being in control, because God knew that long before that it was going to be somebody named Josiah. The son born of the house of David, Josiah by name, that would do that and exactly what he would do. Now look at verse 3. Then he gave the, a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes which are in it shall be poured out. Now when the king heard the saying of the man of God, when he cried against the altar in Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. But his hand which he stretched out against him dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. The king said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and it became as it was before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come here with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall eat uh, no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way which he came to Bethel. So we have recorded here for us the story where this, this young prophet comes to Jeroboam, and quite bold as this young prophet is, he approaches the king and tells the king exactly what's going to take place here in the future. Quite bold because what could Jeroboam have done? When Jeroboam hears this message, if he doesn't like it, what could Jeroboam have done? Have him killed. In fact, Jeroboam at first says to do what to the young prophet? Take him away, seize him. But that's when his hands withered, and then he prays. He asked the young prophet to pray to God, and he prays to God, and his hand is restored. And so here he comes, and he shows quite a lot of boldness in this early part of the story. But not only does he show boldness, he also shows the willingness to serve God and the desire to serve God, because Jeroboam asked him to come back and eat with him. And the young prophet said he was told not to do three things. What were they? Do not eat bread, do not drink water, and do not return by the way you came. So he refuses the king. Can you imagine being invited to eat at the palace, eat with the king? He refuses because he has a desire to serve God. Now, I wish the story ended there. It would be a great story if we could just stop right there, and that would be the end of the story of the young prophet. But in 11 to 19, we have what happens between the young and the old prophet. In verse 11 it says, Now an old prophet was living in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Their father said to them, Which way did he go? 
Now his sons had seen the way which the man of God who came from Judah had gone. So he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you nor go with you. Um, nor will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord, you shall eat no bread nor drink water there. Do not return by going the way which you came. He said to him, I also am a prophet like you, and by an angel uh, like you, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So I went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Something important we need to note about the young prophet. The young prophet takes at face value the word of the older prophet, but what does he not do in this case? He didn't inquire of God. As you follow the story of the young prophet here, and he says, he says, God told me, do not eat bread, go, eat bread or drink water in this place and do not return the way in which I came. That's what he tells Jeroboam. The older prophet comes to him, finds him sitting under the oak tree. He asks him uh, to come with him. He says, I can't. God told me, do not eat bread, do not drink water, do not return by the way in which I came. Then the older prophet says, oh, but an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying to take you back to my house. And at that point, the young prophet should have inquired of God to make sure that this man was telling the truth, but he doesn't. Sadly, as the story goes on, that it came about as they were sitting down at the table in verse 20, and this goes on through 32, we won't read all of it for time's sake, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord and have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in this place of which he said, Eat no bread, drink no water. Your body shall not come to the grave of your fathers. And it came about after he had eaten bread and he had drunk that he saddled a donkey for him for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him, and his body was thrown on the road. The young prophet pays with his life because he does not inquire of God in this story. Here he's done... He, he, he's done what God told him to do up until this point, but at this moment, he does not inquire of God when he's asked, and he eventually pays with his life. And he does not follow the command God had given him at the beginning. And it ultimately leads to him paying with his life. Something important to note here in this text, because this, is, this, this text in 1 Kings 13 is very important. What I learned in 1 Kings 13 is it made a difference what he believed. He believed the lie that he was told and not the truth. The command was, do not eat bread, do not drink water, do not return by the way in which you came. When he goes in and he eats bread and drinks water, he has broken that commandment and he paid with his life. He believed the lie of the older prophet and did not follow the words or the commands of God. And so that's an important lesson for us to learn in 1 Kings chapter 13. Coming down to verse 33 through 34, we have the fact that Jeroboam doesn't make any changes, he just does more evil deeds. Young prophet comes to him and tells him all this. You would think maybe Jeroboam was scared into doing what was right. No, he continues to do more evil deeds in 33 through 34. Now, chapter 14. Chapter 14. We have the story of Jeroboam's wife and Ahijah the prophet. Here's where it gets confusing. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that uh, they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam and go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there whom, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over the people. So, for time's sake, we'll move through this rather quickly. But Jeroboam's son, Abijah, becomes sick. He tells his wife, Go see Ahijah the prophet. This is the prophet that told Jeroboam that he would be king back in chapter 11. He says, go acquire of Ahijah what's going to happen about our son. And here's what you need to take with you in verse 3. Take ten loaves and some cakes, a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. In verse 4, Jeroboam's wife does so, and she comes to Shiloh. And remember, Jeroboam tells her she needs to do what before she goes? Disguise herself. She gets there, and what happens? 
He knows who she is. In verse 5, the Lord had told him, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. You shall thus and thus, uh, say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. As you can imagine, she's disguised herself. She's trying to come and deceive him. It says his eyes were dim because of his age in verse 4, and she's disguised herself and comes to the door thinking, there's no way he's going to recognize who I am. He hears the sound of feet coming in the doorway, and he says, come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another woman? For I'm sent to you with a harsh message. Can you imagine the shock on the wife of Jeroboam's face as she walks in, and she thinks she's disguised herself, and she's coming in to see this prophet who's, whose eyes are dim because of age, and as she's not even in the doorway, she's walking up to the doorway, he hears her footsteps and says, come on in, wife of Jeroboam. How she must be taken back by that. But i tell you something that she is going to have to realize at this point is what? Well, she's going to have to realize that he knows without even seeing her who she is. God must have really spoke to him because he was able to tell who she was by her footsteps. There's not just a good guess. All the people in Israel, he's not going to be that good at guessing as to who's walking through his doorway. But what's the message that Ahijah gives to the wife of Jeroboam? As soon as she steps back into the town, the child is going to die. That's why he told her that he had a harsh message for her in verse 6. So he says, when you go back into the town, the child's going to die as you come back into town. Move on down the text. Let's see exactly what happens. He said in verse 11 that anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat, and he who dies in the field of the birds of heaven will eat, for the Lord has spoken it. He talks about... Um, that in verse 9, that he, Jeroboam, had done more evil than all who were before him. And he had gone out and made other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back, so that he would bring calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut uh, off from Jeroboam every male in verse 10. Then that's when he tells him in verse 12, her in verse 12 that the child will die when she comes back. So you come on down in verse 17, Jeroboam's uh, wife arose and departed and came to, to uh, Tirzah. And she was entering the threshold of the house, the child died. All Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Ahijah the prophet. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles with the kings of Israel. The time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years and he slept with his fathers and Adab his son reigned in his place. You would think, you would think, as you go through the story, that Jeroboam at some point would have made a change. Here Jeroboam is told by Ahijah when Solomon's still living that after Solomon dies, what's going to happen? Back in chapter 11. Kingdom's going to divide. Ten tribes are going to go with you. You move on down the line, what happens? Kingdom divides. Ten tribes go with Jeroboam. Jeroboam institutes worship, uh, idol worship at Dan and Bethel, though. It was wicked in the sight of the Lord. The young prophet comes to him and tells him about this, this prophecy of what's going to happen with Josiah down the road. But he says the sign's going to happen that the altar's going to split and the ashes are going to be poured out. And then Jeroboam, that's when Jeroboam says to seize him, Jeroboam's hand is withered. Well, behold, here, here's the altar. It splits in half. The ashes are poured out. He asked the young prophet, pray that his hand be restored. His hand is restored and he's able to bring it back into himself. You would think at that point that Jeroboam would have uh, turned to serve God, but he didn't. And then as time goes on, his son becomes sick and he sends his wife to Ahijah the prophet. And when she comes to Ahijah, he knows who she is before she even gets in the door. And he tells her exactly what's going to happen concerning the kid. Behold, when she gets back and she walks into the doorway, the child dies. Surely she told Jeroboam, and you would think at that point that Jeroboam would have turned to serve God. But you see, Jeroboam never turns to serve God in spite of all the signs around him. Here's something I need to realize. Sometimes people will not turn to God no matter what happens around them. And so sometimes I think we question when we try and teach others, why is it we're not having success? Why is it all this is going wrong? Sometimes, even though we may give it our best effort, there are those that simply reject the word of God and want to have nothing to do with it. That's just, unfortunately, the way it sometimes is. 
And that's the way it was with Jeroboam. He rejected it even when he was faced with overwhelming evidence of God, uh, 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 those being truly prophets of God and of God working there among them. Yet he continued to reject it. Beginning at verse 21 now, which parallels with chapter 11 of 2 Chronicles, is some of the early days of the reign of Jeroboam. Or Rehoboam, rather. When Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah, he was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, and the city which the Lord had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there, and his mother's name was Nama uh, the Ammonitess. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all their fathers had done with the sins which they committed. For they built for themselves high places and sacred pillars and ashram on every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. They also made cult, male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Now what happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak the king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he took everything, even taking all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made shields of bronze in their place and committed them to the care of the commanders of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. Then it happened as often as the king entered the house of the Lord that the guards would carry them and would bring them back to the, into the guard's room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitess, and Abijam his son became king in his place. And so, over in 2 Chronicles 11, it records more about uh, that. It talks about him living in Jerusalem and some cities that he built, uh, beginning at verse 5. Um, it talks about his descendants, beginning at verse 18 and going through verse 23. That's the end of the chapter in chapter 11. And so it records some more details for us in, in 2 Chronicles 11. But here's something important to remember from the, from the reign of Rehoboam. God was not with them because of the evil they did. But here's an important phrase. They ended up becoming like who? The people they had driven out previously. Remember that God commanded Israel in the book of Leviticus, chapter 11 and in chapter 19... Be holy, for I am holy. As he gives instruction to them and throughout the book of Leviticus, he's telling them here's what they need to do, and it's the opposite of what those of the world are doing. That's what being holy is. It's being set apart, sanctified. It's being different. What's happening here is Rehoboam is, is leading Judah into wickedness to the fact that they are doing what everybody around them had done. What they're doing is they're not being holy. They are instead becoming like everybody else. They're violating the commands of God. Not just all the commands about the, the, the uh, you know, maybe about worship as they're erecting idols or about all this other stuff about service to God, but they're rejecting the command to be holy for I am holy as well. Because God said they needed to be set apart, sanctified, and different, and they were being the opposite of that. Now, beginning at verse 8 and one thing going through verse 8, of, of uh, chapter 15 of 1 Kings, which is also recorded in 2 Chronicles 13, is about the reign of um, Abijam. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Machah, the daughter of Abishalom. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of David, his father David. But for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. So as you move through this text here, as it talks about Abijam, Abijam continues to do exactly what Rehoboam did. He continues in all those sins. But God doesn't take the kingdom away from him completely. God does not cut him off because of what? His promise to David. 
because of the promise he had made to David, he does not completely cut them off. And he, so he's keeping that promise that he made to uh, David. Now, uh, the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, verse 7, and he slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. In the 20th year, uh, Asa becomes king, and that's recorded for us in 9 through 24. I'm going to this rather quickly. Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, in verse 11, like his father David. He put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols his father had made. He removed Micah, his mother. Listen to this. Micah, his mother, from being queen mother because she made a horrid image of an Asherah. And Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it from the book Kidron. But the high places were not taken away nevertheless. The heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. He brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. So as you move through the story here of Asa, Asa is the opposite of his father and his grandfather. He's more like David. He does follow the Lord. In fact, one of the things that he does is he removes his own mother from being the queen mother because of of the horrid image that she had made of an Asherah. There was no nepotism with him. He was making sure that everybody was serving God, and when he found somebody, even his own mother doing what was wrong, he removed her from being the queen mother. He showed no nepotism. There was no favoritism. He made sure everybody was serving to God. Regardless of family relationships, he did what he deemed best. 25 through 31 of the same text is the reign of Nadab, which is going to take over for Jeroboam. That's Jeroboam's son. Um, He becomes king in the second year of Asa, and he reigned over Israel two years. And then down in verse 32... um, after Nadab has died, Abisha becomes king. In the, um, and Basha, the son of Ahijah, became king over all of Tizah and reigned 22 years. And he was at war with Asa. Uh, Asa and Judah and Basha, the king of Israel, were at war all their days, according to verse 32. That's recorded in more detail over in chapter uh, 15, in 14 and 15 of Second Chronicles. Now, we've run through that rather quickly, but let's talk about some practical lessons and practical applications we can make of these texts. So we've got a couple of minutes left. I think the first thing we need to note is the importance of good counsel. Rehoboam needed to seek counsel. He needed to seek counsel from God, but if he was going to seek counsel from men, what he should have done was listen to the wiser of the men. Instead, Rehoboam sought the advice of his, uh, uh, of his close companions and those of his own age. He sought out counsel, yes. A lot of times we tell people they should seek out counsel. But when you seek out counsel from the wrong places, it's not any any good at all. They sought out counsel um, from both the elders and the young men, but he followed the counsel of the young men. I learned something about God being in control. I learned that from the power of prophecy. Because God prophesied, here's what's going to happen, and Josiah is eventually going to destroy an altar. When we get to 2 Kings 23, that's what's going to take place. God told Jeroboam's wife through Ahijah the prophet, that um, the son would die, Abijah would die when she came back into the city, and when she came back in there, Abijah died. It's exactly as God said it was going to be. God is in control. God knows what's going to happen. And we learn that through prophecy. I also see it makes a difference what one believes. I see that in the story of the young prophet. It absolutely made a difference what he believed. He believed the lie of the older prophet, and it cost him his life. If you ask that young prophet, does it make a difference what you believe? He would tell you absolutely it does. It did in his case. It cost him his very life. But I also see something about not showing nepotism. And I say this to say, I learned in this case that even when those that are our own family members are doing what is wrong, then we need to take the necessary steps we wouldn't in the other case. Because that's exactly what Asa did here. Asa has his mother doing what is wrong. He removes her from being queen mother. Because even though she's his own mother, she was doing what was wrong and what was contrary to the law of God. It didn't matter. She wasn't just anybody else to him. It wasn't, well, it, it's, it's my mother, so I can't really do anything about it. He did what he deemed necessary, regardless of family relationships, because, and this is not on the board, but this is important to remember, the relationship to God came first to Asa. And that's what we need to remember. The relationship to God comes first. And so, despite of all family relationships, we do not need to let those 
take priority over our service to God, just as Asa didn't here. Next week, we're going to study chapter 16 through 19 of 1 Kings and chapter 16 and 17 of 2 Chronicles. And we'll finish up the stories of the kings, um, the kings that are there. Thank you for your attention this evening.